everyone. Um, I wish I had one slide that said exactly what you just said. That would have been that would have been done. Um, cool. So uh, I've not done this presentation before. So you guys are my guinea pigs. Um, and I figured I'd go through this really quickly. I think the most important thing to say first is that I'm actually the former head of growth at Instagram. I uh, left that role about a month ago, and so we've got another person coming in, uh, a woman named Carolyn Gaffney from LinkedIn, so really excited about that. I actually moved back over to Facebook, um, sort of extending my seven-year tenure there now. So, but happy to share sort of at least some of the thoughts during my time there. I was there for a little over two years, um, which ended up being roughly the time of 250 million to a little over 500 million in that sort of window of time. Cool, so let's get started. Um, you're gonna hear a ton of really great tactical stuff today, um, and I figured I'd just sort of start with how I thought about growth, um, joining Instagram. Facebook obviously has a really amazing reputation for growth. Um, Instagram has a slightly different one. And it sort of started maybe oddly like this, which is about a year and a half ago or two, um, when I was new to the Instagram growth team, we decided to go visit a company in the Bay Area that was we thought was interesting. Um, for those of you who know Heath Ceramics, it's in Sausalito. It's a company that was started decades ago um, and then was bought by Catherine Bailey and Robin Petrovic um, in 2003 when they had 24 employees and $1 million of revenue. Um, they're not public, but most recently they're probably close to about 20 million in revenue and 174 employees locally. So really sort of an amazing growth story. But what you don't know about this is that when they started, all of these amazing sort of um, pottery that they were selling, they were selling most of it through wholesalers, which was two things to them. One was it was lower margin because they had to have another person in the middle. And the other thing was that they actually were disintermediated with a lot of their customers. So they didn't have a chance to sort of show people what they actually wanted them to see. And so as part of this process, you know, they basically cut off about a third of their sales when Robin and uh, Catherine joined and started from scratch. And started from scratch with this idea that they wanted to create very, very important principles for how they wanted to grow the company, um, even if it meant stopping growth and then going forward. Um, this resulted in a little bit of an awkward conversation because when we arrived, I asked um, Robin, I said, well, great, like, thank you for having us. Um, tell us about your story. And his first question was, um, who are you guys again? And uh, I said, okay, well, we're the Instagram growth team. And he's like, okay, well, I guess my first question is, why do you want to grow? So I was like, oh my gosh, like my entire team's looking at me like, why do we want to grow? Uh, money, a uh, bigger community? And so it sort of like triggered in my head, like there's an important sort of thought process that you need to have around like what you think you're trying to get to. Um, you know, all the tactics in the world and all of the charts that go up and to the right will tell you a dump, bunch of different things, but at the end of the day, it's really important to have an opinion about where you're going. And so that was sort of an, an initial construct I had as I was thinking about Instagram growth. The second one was sort of like me just sort of, you know, dribbling around on the web and finding this artist who I really like. He's an artist out of Atlanta who now lives in Brooklyn. He effectively does art that is like the old motivational posters. Um, and so I was on his website and he had this, which I really liked, except I didn't understand. Um, growth is optional. Well, I mean, it doesn't feel optional. I mean, if Dave McClure was sitting here, I don't know where he is, but he would probably say growth is fucking not optional, right? Um, and that's true. It felt mandatory. Like, I don't understand. Like, why is this true? And so, like, I typed this into the browser and what came up was this guy, John Maxwell, who ends up being a pretty big sort of leadership guru, I guess, amongst five, uh, Fortune 500 companies. And you know, one of the things that he says is, change is inevitable, growth is optional. And in that context, it sort of changes the view a little bit, which is to say that it's not that growth is optional, it's that it's intentional, and it's a choice. And sometimes you shouldn't be growing, like what Robin and Catherine did for, um, for Heath when they first started, but when you're in, you really need to be all in. And so what does that mean? So well, the double click down for this is that he's got this set of constructs. I you know, thought it was good enough to use as a mechanism for effectively sharing like a handful of things that we did at Instagram. 
um, that may or may not actually apply to you, but certainly were some of the things that were useful for us as we went through a two, two and a half year run of, of growing pretty nicely. And that the laws of growth sort of centered around these three areas, which is you had to be intentional about it, you had to have broad awareness for what you were trying to do and who you were as a company, and three is that you had to have consistency in the process. You know, this wasn't like signing up for the gym in January and then all of a sudden not going to the gym January 10th, right? This was about actually like putting in the time, being disciplined, and moving forward um, step after step. So let's talk a little bit about this. So the law of intentionality says growth doesn't happen on its own. Makes sense. Sometimes it feels like it does, but it is actually happening because something is underlying there. You may not know what's happening, but it doesn't happen unless you actually try for the most part. And so when I think about like how that worked at Instagram, um, one is don't grow until you have product market fit. I had that when I joined, so I'm lucky. Um, you know, so sort of obligatory, don't you know, pour water into a leaky bucket. Don't overflow. These are the things that you guys already know, although I will tell you, um, this reminded me of a funny story. Dave McClure and I started a t-shirt business while we were at PayPal together um, because Arnold Schwarzenegger was running for mayor of this state. And we had t-shirts that said, vote for me if you want to live. We sold 50,000 t-shirts in the first day, and then we realized, holy shit, we don't know how to make t-shirts. Um, <laughs> So like, important, right? Like, um, the second thing is, and this is probably gonna be the most photographed slide for everyone here, is I do think the head of growth should report to the CEO. Um, so if you guys get promoted, congratulations. You can thank me later. Um, Facebook obviously has been a pioneer in this construct. Um, the head of growth reports to Mark. Um, I reported to Kevin. I just think that at the high level, when you're intentional about trying to grow, it's actually really important that it's a first order thing, it's, the most, it's one of the most important metrics that you keep at the company, and that you've got someone who's focused on it 100% of the time. Um, and then lastly, it is important to set a goal, but I actually think that doesn't make, it sort of doesn't give growth enough credit for being an empathetic function. So, Let's look at this, which is, there's actually one audience that growth doesn't care about. You know, that's the person who comes to Instagram every day and posts photos and likes your photos. That person's great. I don't care about that person. They're awesome. The four groups of people that I actually care about are these people. The people who have never used your product. Why? They don't know about Instagram, or they don't think Instagram's valuable, or they don't have a smartphone, or they're in a part of the country or a part of the world where Instagram isn't available. There's a hundred different cuts for how this works, but this is one of the groups that I care about. The second group that I care about is you're new to the product. Everyone here knows that retention curves are really, really critical. You've probably got less than seven days, but let's just say on a broader scheme, if you're looking at monthly actives, 28 days, to convince someone to stay. And if you can actually keep at least one of those two people, you're doing freaking really well. That's how hard this game is. But it's really important to understand that once they register, you need to do whatever you can to understand their circumstance so that you can get them to this place where they understand how to use your product. The third group I care about. They use your product, but not really. There's a bunch of people who show up to Instagram once a month, you know, twice a month. They're reacting to a notification or an email that we sent. They're not really users and they're effectively gonna leave us anyways. And so if this is the case and you can identify them, then you should do something about it, right? You should change their experience such that you can educate them how to be the user you want them to be instead of letting them churn because that's what's gonna happen to them. And that's a really important group because at any given point in time, at least for Instagram, that's a few percentage points of the entire population and getting them to stick around, getting them to understand why the product is valuable for them being more aggressive with them than the actual users who are using you every day is something that you should do to try and keep them around. Because the last bucket is super hard. These are the people that have left you because they decided at some point in time that your product wasn't valuable. And getting them back is like really, really difficult. The other thing about resurrected users that you should all know, and we all do this all the time, is we do this thing where it's like, hey, come back to the app 
because it's awesome, and they come back, and they come back to the same app that they hated and leave again, right? You've got probably a retention curve for resurrected users that looks more like 28 seconds. Use it. Treat them differently. Tell them why the product's different. Tell them why the content's different. Tell them why you've done something that makes them want to stick around. Don't just bring them back and show them the same crappy thing that they left before. You're going to lose them again, and you will never get them back. If you do right by those four groups, MAU, all these things will move up in the right direction, but I think it's a more empathetic view of what the world looks like. The second law is the law of awareness. So you should know something about yourself before you grow yourself. Um, there's a handful of things here. Countermetrics do count, and they can be painful. So as an example, growth team has sort of like a semi-nemesis in the protect and care team at Instagram. The protect and care team wants to make sure all the bad guys don't get into Instagram. Um, and if that means a couple of good guys don't get in, fine. The growth team obviously wants all the good guys to get in and wants to make sure that you know, they get in and maybe a couple bad guys get in and that's fine. But really understanding that if you're actually opening up this giant channel of growth and finding out later that it's not real or you haven't figured out whether or not there's a counter metric that balances this, then you're gonna put yourself in a whole different world of trouble. Other examples of this like, are notifications. You ask for notifications and then people decline. The decline rate on notifications is actually a huge deal because the difficulty in getting that back is really, really hard. And if you aren't tracking that in some way, then you're putting yourself in a position where you are effectively gonna find out that your entire user base does not have that permission for you and you will not be able to notify them. The second thing is to fix forward. Um, we see this behavior a lot, which is growth people are the grouchy people who are like, oh, you're changing the product again, damn it, like, you're gonna mess up growth. The reality is, is that the most important thing that a product can do is probably evolve, and that's actually good for growth. I remember having this discussion with um, a lot of the product leaders at Instagram, where it was like, look, the most important thing that can happen right now is that Instagram changes in some material way. Whether it's actually the logo, or whether it's actually the branding, or whether it's the implementation of stories, the growth team can figure out how to optimize on top of that, but you cannot be afraid of the main product actually evolving. If the main product were never to evolve again, growth will stop at some point in time. And so that's actually really key to have an attitude about that, which is every time there's product evolution, fix forward. It may hurt metrics in the short term, but find a way to, to live in the new world and find a way to optimize for that because the product evolutions are really critical. And then the last piece here is to be quantitative and qualitative. And that doesn't mean having like a giant research team that you scour the world with. It just means talking to a handful of people. And you don't need to talk to that many people to figure out what's going on. So let's play a game because these are some of the things that we figured out when we went and talked to some people. So first, which country has the lowest number of faces per photo? Guesses. No. Japan. Japan, why? People hate selfies in Japan because we also don't have filters that make people sort of like beautiful and cleaner skin. But also it turns out in Japan that privacy is so intense that if I take a photo of you and you happen to be in it, and I saw this, you go over to the person and say, hey, is it okay if I post this photo because like you're in it, I'm sorry. Turns out the conversion rate for that's pretty low. Um, <laughs> but that's not something you would necessarily understand unless you went and talked to someone. Second one, who's the most followed person on Instagram? Selena Gomez, over 100 million followers on a base of over 500 million users. That's ridiculous. That in itself is not actually the point. The point is when you go to India and you look at all of the accounts that Indian people follow, where do you think Selena Gomez is in the list? She's not. People in India don't follow Selena Gomez, even though we show Selena Gomez as an option to follow. Like, what the hell, right? Everyone wants to follow Selena Gomez. No, they don't. And actually, what it tells you is that locally, 
local understanding of what people want to follow is actually really, really important. And you can't just assume that some of the top level followers are going to work for everyone in the world. Which major country has more Instagram users than Facebook users? Russia. Why? No, because VK has beaten Facebook in Russia to this point. And instead of integrating to Facebook, we integrate with VK. <laughs> okay. Why are there disproportionately more men than women on Instagram in the Middle East? Privacy? That's roughly correct. What's that? That's actually true. But what's actually happening is there aren't except they all sign up as men because they're worried about being harassed. That's pretty sad, but also something you would not know unless you talk to someone, right? So it's really important to marry your quantitative understanding with even just talking with a handful of people so you understand what's going on. That's context that you'll never get unless you talk with some people. Cool. The last law is the law of consistency. So this is the January gym law, right, which is everyone's excited, you've got a great roadmap, you start going down the path, and then things start getting hard, and some of these experiments don't work. Like, what do you do, and how do you stay disciplined? A few things. There's a certain psychology of roadmap frequency that works well for us. It may not for you. We're obviously a slightly bigger company, but um, I'll share it with you because I like it. Um, which is every half we have a strategy for what we're trying to do. That's great. Um, that may be a little too long if you're a smaller company. But every half we also have three roadmaps. And three roadmaps does sort of this weird and interesting thing, which is like you have one roadmap and you still have more than half of the half left. So you have plenty of time to sort of figure out what to do. You finish two roadmaps, and you actually still have one whole roadmap left if you aren't anywhere near your goal and all those things. And that actually contributes to the sort of this nice psychology that you, people don't feel nervous. They actually feel like they still got opportunity to hit whatever the goals are, and that works really well for us. Um, the other thing about the roadmap frequency is that that effectively means that every roadmap is two months long. Okay, And the way that we structure it is we go two months of trying to figure out what we're going to do for the next uh, sorry, two weeks to try and figure out what we're trying to do, what we're trying to figure out to do, and then we're going to execute for six weeks. So we do that over a two-month cycle. And the key with the execution for six weeks is that everyone shuts off. There's always new ideas. The landscape always changes. And instead of thrashing yourself, find the right frequency for your team. And when the execution window happens, take your ideas, park them in a document talk about it later, talk about it in the next two weeks. Because what you're trying to do is execute on that six week window with as little thrash as possible. And if you think you're being actually more nimble by constantly changing things and moving around, I think what you'll find out is that you're actually not structured in what you're trying to do over time. And that's where some of this discipline comes in. Roadmaps beget roadmaps. So I'm a big believer that analytics folks and research folks need roadmaps too. So when we all say, hey, this is what we're going to do for the next six weeks and execute on a roadmap, I ask them also to tell me what their roadmap is. Because on a six-week window of time, they can actually do something meaningful. Your analytics people and your research people do not want to look at experiment results and tell you what happened all day. They do not want to go into a research room and say, do you like the button on the left side or the right side all day? They hate that. What they want to do is have a window of time to say, OK, you give me six weeks and some data, and I'm going to tell you whether it's more important to show you a friend to connect to when you start on Instagram or Beyonce. Or I'm going to go talk to some researchers and figure out what is the psychology behind starting your account on Instagram as public or private. And then how do we take all of that package it up in something actionable, so when the next roadmap shows up and you're in that two-week window, you're not starting from scratch. You've got a bunch of really great quantitative, qualitative analysis that feeds into that two weeks, rinse and repeat. Okay? I know everyone in this room thinks that they can just build a roadmap from scratch, and that's fine. 
it's awesome to not have to build a roadmap when someone else does it for you. And so I would encourage you to do that with your analytics and research folks to the extent that you have those resources. Um, the last thing is keep calm. You know, like, growth is the most stressful freaking job ever. When everything's bad, you're bad. When everything's good, you're like, why the hell is it good? You just don't know. And so, <laughs> like, I figured I'd just share with you um, on a completely arbitrary chart the feelings that I've had, certainly, at various moments when we've been watching these things. So, one, damn it, what happened? January 1st was so awesome, we acquired all these users in December, and they all turned out, and we're now back to basically November numbers. You're just gripping, like, what's going on? Then you're like, what was that? <laughs> and it turns out that's Valentine's Day. Great, everyone loves taking pictures on Valentine's Day. That's phenomenal. No, that awesome growth thing was so great up until none of the acquired users I got stuck around. Why did that intern push code that logged out all the iOS users? <laughs> that actually happened. <laughs> Spam team didn't do their job came over and said, hey, so it turns out there's about a couple percentage of accounts that actually aren't real, guys. We had to correct that. Oh my god, everyone's had this moment. You don't even know what's going on, you're just crying. <laughs> um, it turns out it's actually good, and this is the side story, which is Instagram is so young in its demographic that the reason why there's a dip this time every year is because they go back to school. So it's really interesting. We have this intraday chart of people and their usage, and you see green throughout the day. Like, teens are like, green, green, green. And then literally in September, it's like, green until 9 in the morning, red. And then green, 3 p.m. till the evening. And that's that dip, every year. And then hopefully all of you, if you've done all these things right, get to experience a little bit of what we've had the fortune of experiencing um, at Instagram, which is like that everything works and that you know what's going on and you're doing really good experiments based off of not only a quantitative understanding of your ecosystem, but also a qual qualitative understanding of it, and that you get some good stuff on the other side. That's all I've got for you. Thank you. I don't know if there are questions. What's the timing? How do you know if growth is due to optimal growth strategy or due to a fabulous product? Um, it's a good question. You cannot A-B test all of your growth stuff. Um, so it's tricky. And so uh, this is why, actually, why I say it's stressful to be a growth person. If things are going not well, it's on you. If things are going well, what question do you get? Well, was it you? <laughs> right? Um, and the short answer is, you can't always know these things. Um, we always like to do um, holdouts so we have an understanding of it, but just, just to keep in mind, it's easy to throw the word holdout out, but like, you know, it means you're leaving a percentage of people in your community behind on some shittier version of the product, and so you should do that with like incredible like consciousness. Um, but here's an example, which is, we um, have an algorithm that shows you who you should follow in the system. So whether it's Beyonce or Snoop Dogg or your friend or your mom, um, and that's constantly trying to figure out what the right thing to show is. But there's certainly like any number of algorithms that you can show to people that you know, may have a short-term effect or may have a long-term effect. We actually do have a holdout on that. And so we have a very clear understanding that when we make changes to that and we hold people back on an older algorithm, it's important in this particular area, most people don't know they're being hold, held back in an older algorithm, so it doesn't have a UI effect on people, and then see the difference in terms of like growth over time. I will tell you that the algorithm that suggests to you who you should follow is responsible for at least two to three percent of growth from Instagram on the MAU side over the last couple years. So it's pretty significant. Um, I would not encourage you to try and do this for every single possible thing. You just need to have conviction over some products that are good. We moved to phone registration over email registration and did not look back. 
and while the initial numbers didn't look perfect, it was absolutely the right thing to do because this world is about phone numbers and not emails anymore. Um, so do it where you can, um, but at the same point in time, like this one's actually fairly difficult. Um, what are some of the favorite or memorable growth campaigns that you saw at IG? Um, the two campaigns, so like prior to me being at IG, we never sent any emails. In fact, none of the emails were even confirmed because IG didn't require email confirmation before you actually joined. So um, it was memorable in the sense that we sent about 600 million emails and got like 300 million bounces. Um, that was pretty crazy because we just didn't, we didn't know it, what was confirmed and what wasn't. Um, the thing that was probably most, the most stressful was probably the brand change, right? Like, you know, I mean, that's something that you certainly cannot A-B test the, the magnitude of the, you know, whether or not people like it or not. That's purely qualitative. Um, again, we were in this mode of fixing forward, but like, you know, sharing with the entire world that we had changed our logo, especially given the fact that, you know, logo changes can be positive or negative, was sort of a, an interesting thing, but we did, um, we did sort of face that sort of head on and sent a bunch of emails and that was actually ended up being a really valuable growth um, mechanism for us in that window of time. Um, how does it work with three roadmaps at once? Do they overlap in time or do they go sequentially? They go sequentially. So um, what it means is effectively, and you've got a little bit of buffer here because there aren't you know, like uh, eight week segments that actually add up to the entire year, but it means you spend the first two weeks having the team figure out what they want to do. What analytics, what research do you, have you already collected? What brainstorms do you want to have? All that stuff. You get it in a roadmap. I do not encourage like high fidelity you know, presentations. Just like write down what you're going to do for a six week window. You go into the six week window. You execute the hell out of what you said you were going to do. Once you're out, the next two weeks are sort of rinse and repeat, but it also gives um, engineering a time to sort of like you know, uh, refactor code, fix some bugs and all that stuff, and it's kind of a nice breather for that team as well, um, but totally sequential in sort of how you do it. So one after another after another. What are some of favor, uh, what were the main drivers of international growth for Instagram? What moved the needle internationally? Um, there's a bunch of things here um, which, you know, are pretty specific to specific countries, I would say. Um, so example, like Russia, integration with VK and OK, which is actually the secondary network there, were really big. And that actually is one of the things that skyrocketed us past Facebook. Um, uh, another one, uh, as an example, is just like internationalization and, and, and language. Um, one of the bigger ones that actually wasn't like a, we all of a sudden saw giant growth, was just working really hard to get local accounts that people wanted to follow. So like the India example I gave before, it turns out that everyone wants to follow Cricket and Bollywood, and we actually needed to go out there and make sure that the Cricket and Bollywoods were on Instagram. And that actually makes a huge difference for people because of the local feeling around like what they want to do. The, the, the superstars that are global are great. Like we will have that superpower and that's awesome. Um, but it turns out it's the mix of friends and local and, the, and sort of the global stuff that actually makes Instagram work for most people. Uh, was there a time? One more? Okay. One more. Uh, how is the growth team structured? What roles do startups need for a growth team? It's a good question. Um, I think the, the, key, the key people that are probably part of the growth team, product team, um, analytics team, research team, design, engineering. That's probably your baseline. As far as structure goes, it's exactly what I showed you in that chart with people. It's who's gonna work on the vast majority of people who have not used Instagram yet, and where are you gonna go in terms of figuring out which one of those buckets to go after? Of all the people who are joining, how are you gonna make sure that they stick around after registration? Of all the people who are literally like languishing on Instagram today, visiting once a month, what are you gonna do to get them so that they're more active on the platform? And for all the people who have left us, what are you gonna do to get them back instead of showing them the same thing that they left? Like how do you engage them again on opportunities to get them not only back to the ecosystem but hopefully into this engaged state? I'm very audience centric on this one. I want people to make sure that they understand the community and what they want versus just acquisition or retention. I mean, they map fairly cleanly, but there's something different about being empathetic to, the, to that group. I think that's my last question. Thank you very much. I will be around, so happy to answer questions after.